What is going on everyone? My name is Codemore and welcome back to Electronics episode 19. In this episode we are going to learn about capacitors. Now capacitors are able to store electrical charge and they act kind of like mini batteries. Now they're not exactly like batteries but that's just one way to kind of think about it for now. Don't worry we'll get into a more advanced explanation in a little bit. But for now let me show you some of the most common types of capacitors because capacitors like many of the other electronics components come in many different shapes, sizes, and types. Perhaps one of the most common types of capacitors that we'll see, and probably one of the main capacitor types that I'll be using throughout this tutorial series, are the electrolytic capacitors which are shown here. Now electrolytic capacitors can be very small and they can be very large. Of course in this tutorial series we'll probably be only dealing with the smaller of the electrolytic capacitors. Now when we learned about LEDs we know that one of the metal leads coming from the LED is longer than the other and that means it's the anode or it has to be connected to the more positive part of the battery. Now electrolytic capacitors act the exact same way. As you can see on this capacitor at the right here you can see that this metal lead here is much longer than the other metal lead here. So the longer of the two metal leads, in this case this one, would be the anode, or it would have to be connected to the more positive side of your circuit, while the shorter leg over here would have to be connected to the more negative side of the circuit. That's very important to remember whenever you're working with electrolytic capacitors. Another way to tell which of the leads of the capacitor is positive or which is negative, many of the electrolytic capacitors will have a stripe on the side of them with a negative symbol and some arrow. That means the lead that is closest to this stripe here should be the cathode or should be connected to the more negative side of your circuit. On the electrolytic capacitor on the right here, we can't see that stripe, but we know because of this shorter lead, this must be the negative part or the cathode. It's also important to remember that all capacitors have a voltage rating. On the capacitor on the left here, you can see upside down, it says 35V. That means this should be placed in a circuit of a maximum of 35 volts. You should not put this capacitor in a circuit with more than 35 volts. So it's also important to keep an eye on the voltage maximum that these capacitors have. Those are electrolytic capacitors, let's move on to another type of capacitor. This capacitor here is called a ceramic disc capacitor, and they're probably the second most common type of capacitor that we'll be using in this tutorial series. They're called disc capacitors because, as you can see, the top of them are shaped kind of like a little flat disc. Now these capacitors, ceramic disc capacitors, are not polarized. So you can put either this lead as the anode and connect it to the plus side and this lead to the negative side, or you can even do it the other way around. You can make this the negative side and this the positive side. It doesn't matter which way you connect ceramic disc capacitors together. So that's one of the main differences between ceramic disc capacitors and electrolytic capacitors. You can connect ceramic disc capacitors in any way that you want in your circuit. The third type of capacitor that I'm going to show you are called polyfilm capacitors. And just like disc capacitors, they are not polarized meaning you can connect either this lead or this lead to the positive or negative side of your circuit, it doesn't really matter. I'm probably not going to be using any of these film capacitors within this tutorial series, but it's probably another type that you might see in some electronics work. So we've seen the capacitors, now what the heck do they do and how do they work? Now before I get too far into the explanation of capacitors, let me just show you the schematic symbols for capacitors. Now there are two main schematic symbols for capacitors that you will see, and these are them. The first schematic symbol that you'll see here is often used for either a ceramic disc capacitor or any capacitor that is not polarized. It doesn't matter which way you connect the leads. Most often they're used like that, but of course you might just see this as a general form of a capacitor in a schematic. The other form of schematic symbol for the capacitor over here on the right is generally used for polarized capacitors like electrolytic capacitors. As you can see, instead of two straight lines, we have a straight line and a curved line over here. Now this straight line generally signifies the anode or the more positive side of the component while the curved side represents the cathode or the more negative side of the component. So that's the important difference between the two schematic symbols. Generally, when you see one of these, it's probably an electrolytic capacitor because it is polarized. So let's move on to how these capacitors work. Now, all capacitors have some type of capacitance rating measured in the unit farads. And the farad unit is often denoted by the capital letter F, like so. Now, the farad unit, we don't really need to know for our purposes the technical details of what the unit actually means. Of course, it would be very beneficial if you did know the technical side behind the farad unit, 
So if you want to know that, go ahead and do a bit more research online, that would be very beneficial. However, for our purposes for this tutorial series, we just have to be familiar with the farad unit and that should be good enough to continue following along with the series and eventually build an 8-bit computer. Now, 1 farad is actually a very, very, very large value for our type of electronics work. We won't even be touching a full farad unit. In fact, we won't be dealing with farads at all. Instead, we will probably be dealing mainly with the microfarad, denoted by this weird little letter U kind of, and the capital letter F, this is a microfarad. And a microfarad is one millionth, 0 0.000001 farads. So many of the capacitors that we will be using are measured in microfarads and not full farads themselves. We may also be using nanofarads and F, this is a nanofarad, and a nanofarad is even smaller, it is one thousandth a microfarad, so it is extremely small. These are the two units of farads that we'll be using, because like I said, a farad is a very large value for the type of electronics work that we will be doing. So this is what a capacitor does. Here I have a very simple circuit, it consists of an LED and a resistor just hooked up in a regular circuit. Now I have a 9 volt battery here, and I have a one thousand microfarad capacitor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the negative or the cathode side of the capacitor, touch it to the cathode side of the battery, and the positive side of the capacitor to the positive side of the battery just for about a second or two. Then I'm going to hook up the negative side of the capacitor to the negative power rail on my breadboard, and the positive side of the capacitor to the positive power rail, and as you can see the LED lights up and then slowly begins to dim as the capacitor discharges. Now one quick note, please don't go out and just shove a capacitor anywhere in any circuit just yet. Because in order to do that properly and safely, you're going to need another electronics component that we haven't talked about quite yet. Alright, so what happened in that circuit? We touched the capacitor to the battery, just for a few seconds, and then we plugged the capacitor into our circuit. And all of a sudden it powered the LED for a few seconds, and then the LED began to dim down. So what was it about touching the capacitor to the battery that made this work? Now capacitors are made in many different ways, but the basic form of a capacitor is you have a piece of conductive material, and you have another piece of conductive material. Now these two pieces of conductive material are separated by usually a very, very, very thin layer of a dielectric material, which is mainly an insulator. So essentially, we have two metal sheets separated by a very, very, very small amount of insulation. And that is the basis of all capacitors and how they work. So something as simple as literally a piece of metal with a tiny bit of separation from another piece of metal can power up a circuit. So let's take a look what goes on when we actually connect this to something like a battery. Here is sort of a side view of what I just showed you. These two places here are the two pieces of conductive material and just think that they're flat up against each other and separated by a tiny little sliver of dielectric material. So without any battery power or anything, these plates have some positive and negative charges on them and they probably have roughly the same amount of positive and negative charges on both of the plates. Alright, well that's fine and dandy, but what happens when we connect these plates to the battery? So essentially, when we connected the capacitor to the battery, one of these plates was being connected to the cathode and one of the plates was being connected to the anode, essentially. So that caused any negative charges on this plate here to flow out and through the battery, which basically left this plate as mainly positively charged with a bunch of positive charge on it. Whereas this plate over here gained many, many electrons or negative charges, right? They it gained electrons, so it's more negatively charged now. And as we kept this battery plugged into the capacitor, these charges kept on separating and grew a bigger difference between the two plates. Now because these two metal plates are so close together, these uh, charges actually get attracted to the edge of the plates, or towards one another rather. So since each plate has more of a number of opposite charges, they try to attract each other really, really closely, but they can't quite make it there because of the dielectric material in between. So that's what happened when we plugged the battery in. Now let's say that we disconnected the battery here, we broke off the connection. These plates still have that difference in charge. Now instead of the battery here, we hooked up the exact same capacitor after it's all charged up and it has a large difference between the two plates. 
We then hooked up these two plates to instead of a battery an LED and instead of drawing everything out here I'm just going to draw a circle to represent the LED but there was also a resistor in there. So when we connected this up to the LED and let me just mark that here this was the LED here basically the charges began to equalize. Now it doesn't matter which way you think of it whether these negative or electrons were traveling through over to this plate or if the positive charges are traveling to this plate, you can think of it either way. But one way or the other, this plate began to lose some of its negative charge through the LED, right? Through the LED and onto this plate. So now this plate's gaining negative charges here. And then, of course, maybe some positive charges going this way. So this plate is beginning to gain positive charges because all the plates wanted to do this entire time are equalize their charges, have the same number of positive and negative charges on each plate. So once that LED was hooked up to the plates, they had a pathway to change out those charges. So because all these electrons are flowing through the LED, that's essentially the same thing a battery does. It, it causes electrons to flow. So if a capacitor is causing these electrons to flow from plate to plate, it generates current. Now it's important to remember that no current actually travels through the capacitor itself. I mean, the schematic symbol literally has a gap in between the circuit. There is no current traveling through the capacitor. However, when you hook up a capacitor in a circuit like this, it allows current to flow through the component because the charges are traveling through the component onto the other plates, which creates, of course, electricity, that motion of all these particles moving through the electronic component. So no current actually flows through the capacitor itself, but it can cause current to flow through your circuit. And as we begin to use capacitors, they will become a bit more understandable for you. All right, so now let's get some miscellaneous learning out of the way here. Now there is something called a time constant when it comes to capacitors, called an RC time constant, and that's signified by the letter tau often. And the equation is the tau equals, or the time constant equals, and I'm probably saying that really bad, the resistance times the capacitance, right? And capacitance is measured in farads, of course, where the time constant tau is measured in seconds and resistance in ohms. This is the amount of time it takes the capacitor to charge 63% about. So after this many seconds, a capacitor of capacitance, whatever we plugged in here to the equation, will have 63% of the voltage accumulated within the capacitor. And it's generally safe to say that it's 98% charged, so close to 100% charged after four tau periods. So if that sounded like some nonsense, let me try this. We will calculate the time constant, right? So we have tau equals the resistance, let's say we had uh, 10,000 ohms of resistance, and our capacitor was rated at 1,000 microfarads, which is the same thing as 0 0.001 farads, of course. So if we did this, we got tau, or the time constant, to equal 10 seconds. So in this scenario, with a 10,000 ohms of resistance leading up to a 1,000 microfarad capacitor, it will take about 10 seconds for the capacitor to charge 63% fully of its voltage. And it should be almost fully charged after four periods of the second, so it should be fully charged after tau times four or 40 seconds of being connected to your voltage source or whatever. Now this is a pretty extreme example. So that is how you can estimate the amount of time it'll take for a capacitor to get fully charged. Now I know that this video hasn't gone too far in depth with capacitors, but I will explain one more thing in this tutorial series, and that is what happens if we have two capacitors in series? Well, in uh, the form of resistors, if these were two resistors in series, we would just add the resistance values together. But when two capacitors are in series, we do something a bit different. So let's say the capacitance ratings of these uh, capacitors are F1 and F2. And that's not really the proper form to write those in, but nonetheless, let's continue here. The total amount of capacitance, the total capacitance rating, which I'll do TF, is going to equal one over all of the capacitance ratings together, dot, dot, dot. So one over the total amount of capacitance, 
is going to equal 1 over the capacitance ratings for all of your capacitors in series. This is the exact same equation essentially for resistors in parallel. Except don't get confused because this is for capacitors in series. Now if you were to have two capacitors in parallel instead, so let's say we have more of a situation like this, in parallel instead, the equation will look very similar to that when resistors are in series. So basically, the total amount of capacitance rating is just going to equal F1 plus F2 and on and on and on. So it's the same equations as resistors just flipped around when you're in series and parallel. So that was today's video on capacitors. Again, the more that we use capacitors, the more we're actually going to understand about capacitors and when to use them and how they work and everything. Thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you guys in the next video.